Yeah. All right, guys, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the CU Hacking Club. I assume that's why you're all here. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of topics tonight. Matt Monaco is going to be going first, and he's going to talk to you guys about Tor. Um, and then I will go with whatever remaining time we have and talk to you guys about Bitcoin. So the overarching theme is kind of anonymity enhancing systems, which you'll see in both of these projects. Um, Matt Monaco is a PhD student here. He runs the C-Cell, and he's also Linux expert extraordinaire. So not necessarily related to talk tonight, but if that's how you might interact with them in other portions of your life. So, we are recording the lectures tonight. If you ask questions, the audio will be recorded, so be aware. Um, they'll be up on YouTube later under a Creative Commons license, and you can do with them as you may. So with that, I'll let Matt get started. Okay. So, I think I'm filling in for Ali, right? Yeah, Ali can't be your time. Uh, so the other day in class, I just I did this presentation on the tour paper from uh, 2004 or six, I think. So I'm just gonna give it again to you guys. Um, do you guys know that tour at all? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if you have any questions, ask me. If you know something that I don't, please say something because we want the correct information on the camera. Um, one one disclaimer is uh, the information I have is from the tour paper uh, published in 2004. Um, I didn't really update it with the current state of the software, so there might be some discrepancies. Um, so Tor is an anonymous, oh, and I can't say anonymizing, so <laughs> I'm gonna stumble over myself a lot. Okay, so Tor is a network to, to allow people to communicate with other people anonymously. Um, the, the concept behind Tor was originally called onion routing, um, and it comes out of the Freehaven project, which is from MIT, and the Navy. So I think the original use of Tor was so that the military can communicate out on the internet anonymously. Um, so the Tor project itself start, started around 2002, and then it was published formally in 2004. Um, so in, in a sentence, Tor is a low latency, perfectly forward, secure, anonymizing network. Um, the low latency means it doesn't uh, buffer your traffic. Uh, randomly to help uh, anonymize you. Um, there's other, uh, in this paper, there's a whole bunch of uh, related projects to Tor. Um, some of them reorder your packets and hold on to them for random amounts of time as a way to anonymize you. Um, and perfectly forward secure means that um, if the asymmetric public and private keys are compromised, uh, down the road, the original session key won't be also compromised later on. So if your public and private key are hacked or uh, recovered by somebody, data that you've already sent over the Tor network is still secure. Um, do you guys know public key cryptography? Um, so I, I can like this a bit. I have one slide on asymmetric cryptography, just as an aside. Um, normal symmetric cryptography, um, the same password is used to encrypt the data and decrypt it. In, in asymmetric cryptography, you have a public key and a private key. You hold on to your own public uh, private key, nobody can see it. And then other people use your public key. So if I want to send something to Andy, I take Andy's public key, encrypt the data with that, and then he decrypts it with his private key. And uh, what uh, asymmetric cryptography gets you is that you can exchange, you never actually have to exchange private key private passwords or anything, okay? Um, yeah, so that's really all that's important. So this is the example I went through in class. Uh, I think it's actually more appropriate to you guys in class. But um, you know, one of the things that Tor is good for is for white hat hackers to attack people without being discovered. So this is this uh, beautiful woman who's um, from the Westboro Baptist Church. Uh, there are a bunch of asses. Um, but they're also good lawyers. So if you want to attack them, attack their website, attack their presence, because that's all they're really about is media presence, um, you probably want to do it anonymously. So Tor is a good tool to do that. <laughs> not that we're condoning this. <laughs> well, and so if you're offended, um, I'm not sorry. Some other uses of Tor, legitimate uses, are uh, privacy, just general internet privacy, you know, everybody's trying to attack, uh, track you. Uh, 
discover your habits online. Um, you know, the original reason was for military use. Um, it's also big in, you know, tumultuous areas of the world where governments are trying to shut down the internet and censor people and put out propaganda. So, um, you know, people use Tor to um, broadcast what's actually happening in a particular country or a particular area. Um, the paper also said that they know of um, departments within specific companies that use Tor to hide their traffic and hide their trade secrets against other departments. I think Microsoft is probably, you know, they weren't named, but they're a good example of that. I think Microsoft is known for um, different groups within the company uh, being hostile to other groups. Um, but they still they share infrastructure, so they use Tor. Okay. All right, so how do we attack Westboro Baptist Church? We need some kind of privacy screen. And that's what Tor is going to give to us. Um, so I just basically color scheme this. I don't really label anything. But um, basically, Tor is made up of, um, you know, you have an onion proxy. And that's the yellow guy here. This is uh, a piece of software that you're running. And then volunteers all around the world um, are running these onion routers. Um, in the paper, there were you know, just a few. Nowadays, there's thousands of them. Um, and so basically, you take the normal traffic that you would send out your, your uh, uh, interface on your computer, you send it to the, your onion proxy, and then that will send it through this network. Um, the uh, onion proxy is usually just running on your own computer. Like for example, I actually have Tor installed on my laptop, um, and it's a SOX proxy, um, and you know we don't need to get into the details of what that is. But if you go into Firefox and go to your network settings and go to proxies, you can set up a SOX proxy, um, and you know all you have to do is run Tor, point at uh, it's like port 9050 is the default, and there you go, all your traffic is anonymous. Um, but also the, um, the, SOX, the uh, Onion proxy um, could be run like, as a service for an entire network. So our school could, for example, run an Onion proxy that we could all use. Um, but that's a little less anonymous because your traffic wouldn't be anonymous until it hits the Onion proxy. Um, so now what happens is um, the Onion proxy, or just the, the Tor software on your computer, is going to pick an arbitrary path through the network to get to the destination. Okay. Um, there's no. It's completely up to you as a client how you want to use the network. Um, so what happens is the proxy creates. It's what we're creating is going to be called a circuit. Okay. Um, and the proxy is going to do this one hop at a time. So first, it's going to contact the first onion router and set up a, um, a session key so that they can communicate. And then once it has the circuit extended to one onion router, it's going to send a command to this one to um, extend the circuit to another one, and so on and so forth. Um, and then there's a lot of public private keys going on here. Um, each of these uh, onion routers has a separate session key um, for every other onion router. Um, each path in the circuit has a separate set of keys. Um, and there, there's a few more we don't have to get into the details. Um, but the point is that if this guy is what's driving everything. And he's negotiating a, a link here, and then another link here, and so on and so forth. So can the first onion router that the proxy connects to tell that it's talking to a proxy, not just a random onion router, or? Uh, yes. Oh. Uh, so one, one additional layer of uh, anonymity that you can uh, get is if you are running an onion router on your own node. So then the rest of the network can't distinguish oh. if, if you're generating original traffic or just passing traffic. Um, so I'm not going to go into too many details about this, but uh, Tor operates on 512 byte cells. So everything that, you know, Tor has its own commands like uh, relay commands and destroy circuit commands. They're all uh, a 512 byte cell 
with a header that has the command in the router you want to send it to, and then when you're actually passing data through the network, it's split up into 512 byte chunks. Um, and then these cells are where the onion concept comes from. Um, it's in my office. <laughs> Basically what happens is the cell gets encrypted with each onion router at a time. So if I want to send uh, a cell to this guy, what I do is I, I take my original data and I encrypt it with the key I have negotiated with him and then re-encrypt it and then re-encrypt it again. So as the message gets passed through the network, um, this guy peels off a layer this guy peels off the layer until it finally gets to the last guy, and then it's um, you know, plain text or whatever you had originally sent. So that's the whole onion notion. Um, and then, yeah, the, the cells themselves contain uh, an ID so that um, the, the routers know where their, the next hop is, um, a command, and it's bulk data. Um, so now that we have this kind of layered encryption scheme, what happens is, is that any particular onion router only knows about its predecessor and successor in the circuit. And that's where the whole magic happens. So um, this guy has no idea about this onion proxy. So um, you know, he, he's uh, aware of the whole scheme going on, but these guys uh, don't have a full view the circuit. Okay, so um, if you're, you can configure your uh, onion proxy to set up uh, circuits for however size you want. Like, usually it's about four or five, but it's definitely got to be at least two. Otherwise, um, the network itself will see your source and destination. Then the, the last uh, onion router in the network is just it becomes the exit node. Um, any router could be the exit node. It's just it's your choice. But uh, we'll see in a minute that there's some special characteristics of this node. So once you have your, your complete circuit set up, um, your destination and the rest of the world sees traffic as just coming from that last exit node. And then, so you can send your message to the Westboro Baptist Church anonymously as far as the, the church is concerned and the network itself and the rest of the world. Anybody looking at the network cannot tell that you sent the message. Um, okay, just some random information. Although, can you go back one slide a sec? Yeah. So, the target, though, thinks that somebody sent the message, right? Yeah. Who do they think sent the message? That exit node. Okay. So, um, they talk about this a little bit in the paper. Basically, they suggest giving a host name to your uh, onion routers as like anonymous or um, tour network so that people know that it's not coming from you specifically. It's just it's a service that you're offering. Yeah. Uh, how do you <clears throat> negotiate keys with all the nodes that make you a direct connection? It's just when they're like publicly available public keys? Or you said like the first node has to encrypt it for every node that's going to hit, right? No. Uh, well, the proxy encrypts it for every node. Okay. Yeah, for every node in the chain. Yeah. So, the, so how does the onion routers, the they know about all the other onion routers. So what you do is you send a relay command to this one that says, I have something that you need to send to this guy. And he just, all he knows is that he's sending information to here. He doesn't know what the actual information is. Right, but how does he get the key for the second node? Um, like the first, the very first proxy, how does he get the keys for every single node in the chain? He doesn't need to know the keys for every node in the chain. But the proxy one. needs to know the keys for every node. The proxy needs to know? Yeah, the proxy yeah. keys are yeah. and, and, and any given one, he just needs, he's got a, an ID to identify the circuit that is private to him when, or her, when uh, the circuit's being set up. And all he knows is that if he gets a message, it's opaque encrypted data except for the header, and if it has a specific circuit ID on it, he just knows the next place to send it, or, or you know, depending on the direction. But the proxy uses the public keys from each of the nodes in the network to set up yeah. the encryption. So, right. Right. Well, oh, so, uh, so, I mean, if they're using the public keys from all these different nodes, are there like certificates involved and stuff? How do you know these Yeah, are it's all TLS. Oh, okay. There's a whole public key infrastructure. Cool. And there's another kind of node that we're about to get to. 
Other question. So since each node can only see the previous and succeeding node, and it's only identified for which circuit it is the circuit ID, what prevents like some asshole from just using it as a botnet? Because if you just create a bunch of circuits, no one can tell that they're all coming from you, and you have like a ton of computers sending whatever you want at whoever. And if you said there's enough computers on there, you can DDoS someone by yourself. Yeah, so the, the Tor network itself is somewhat uh, resilient to those types of attacks, but there is a bit of a social issue here and a public image issue. So you can use the network to do all sorts of crappy things. Um, they just hope you don't because oh, we'll get into it. Also, as a quick aside, you don't actually really ever see Tor used in DDoS attacks because Tor adds a lot of overhead. So, yes, from your one computer, you could make it look like it was coming from a bunch of different places, but all of that traffic still has to originate from your computer. The bottleneck is your computer, and now it's even worse than if you were trying to DDoS yeah, just from your sense. computer because there's extra overhead on all that traffic. Okay. So, when like Anonymous does you know, big volunteer DDoS attacks, they tell people not to use Tor because the network slows it down too much. It's not actually, you can't get the throughput through Tor to really mount a realistic DDoS attack. That makes sense. Yeah. I read some conspiracy theory that said that law, law, law enforcement has a bunch of nodes set up randomly, and then that way, given some amount, they can trace things back. Is that? Um, I'm going to talk about okay. Tor model a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's perfect. Okay, so um, Tor is TCP only, so anything under TCP, like HTTP, works. Um, but you can't do UDP over Tor, you can't ping over Tor, you can't do general IP traffic. Um, there's alternatives that hone in on specific protocols. Uh, the developers of Tor felt that TCP was um, the right choice, and I, and I think that they're right too. Um, um, let's see. Uh, a single TCP session will operate only on a single circuit, but your onion proxy, the, the yellow guy, um, will actually set up a whole bunch of circuits and rotate them and bring them down and stuff because you, you're randomizing the circuits that you're using too. You don't want just you don't want just one long lived circuit. Otherwise, it's going to be easier for someone to identify you. Um, and it, many TCP sessions can be uh, multiplexed over a single circuit for a given period of time. Um, I noticed when I'm using Tor, it's like every minute to five minutes uh, my exit node changes. So I'll be on Google on Tor and I'll be in, I'll get like the German Google and then I'll get the Chinese Google. So, it's pretty cool. Um, and then there's one more thing. Uh, Tor has this leaky pipe um, concept where any particular cell that you send through the network, you can use um, any of the, um, you can use any one of these along your circuit as an exit node to kind of like juke the people that are trying to uh, attack you. So, you know, I can send most of my traffic from here, but then every now and then I can send one bit of information from here directly to my destination. Um, uh, Tor heuristically has to determine if you're using like just like batch throughput, like uploading files or interactive traffic like SSH, um, which is important because the, the developers of Tor want Tor to be usable, um, and then also to prevent some types of DDoS attacks, they throttle on the circuit level and on the stream level. So that's how they prevent, try to prevent attacks against the network itself, not emitting uh, denial of service attacks from the network, but you know the network itself is probably vulnerable. Um, so to kind of bootstrap the Tor network, you have these directory servers, and they have information about all the onion routers. Uh, when you install Tor, it comes pre-configured with the list of directory servers. Um, so, um, and then the directory servers are what generate the global view of the Tor network, like the list of <coughs> routers, where they are, where their capabilities are. Um, the status of a particular underrunner is just a majority vote by the directory servers. Um, and then new onion routers, this is important, are added to directories in like human land. Uh, it's phone calls, it's emails, it's personal relationships. Um, this is how we prevent, or try to prevent, um, compromised routers from actually getting on the network. Um, and then the directory servers, to kind of um, make sure that the network itself is behaving properly, will test the network by creating circuits that target specific routers to make sure that they're not holding on to traffic or manipulating traffic. Um, 
Um, yeah, so users are really important to Tor. If there's only one guy on Tor, then it's obvious who it is. So the designers of Tor wanted to make sure that it's easy to install, it's easy to deploy, um, it's easy to understand. So they actually chose some usability. Um, you know, when they had a development choice, they actually made some choices based on usability over overall technical merit. Um, but, you know, Tor is widely used now, so I think they made the right decision. <clears throat> and then another big thing about them is they wanted to make sure Tor had a good public image because this can be abused. You can use it for bad things. You can use it for illegal websites and doing all sorts of horrible things. But um, it, I think it's a really important thing to have. So you, you want to try to make sure people aren't using Tor for bad shits for good. Um, so um, I talked about the exit node a little bit. Um, part of the whole uh, push to make sure Tor is used it, it, for good things has to do with um, an exit policy that each onion router defines for itself and advertises. So if you choose to use that one, a particular onion router as your exit node, um, you're subject to the uh, exit policy. Um, and it's basically a firewall. The exit policy will say that you can or cannot talk to certain websites from this router. So if you want one that's not on uh, a particular exit node's um, exit policy, you have to choose a different one. Um, some onion routers choose to only be used as middlemen, so they can't be used as exit nodes at all. They just will relay traffic through the network. Um, and then some of them um, will have like private networks behind them, so you can have these anonymous private networks out there that um, only exist off of a specific onion router. Okay, the, the threat model of Tor. Um, a global passive adversary, um, is basically someone that can see the whole network and all of the input and output of the network. Tor does not protect against this. Um, if they can see um, uh, source traffic and destination traffic, there's a couple of different attacks that Tor just is not going to help them with. But it's rare that somebody will actually have this kind of um, view of the Tor network. Um, so it assumes that an adversary can observe part of the network, can manipulate traffic on the network, can operate a hostile onion router, can operate a hostile uh, Tor directory, um, and even compromise some of the directories. So Tor is resilient to um, you know, a compromised network, just not you know, the majority of the network can't be compromised. Um, passive attacks against the Tor network are basically like traffic analysis. Um, so if you are looking at the input and output of the network, you can correlate timings of packets to determine a source and destination, and you can correlate sizes of packets. Uh, this one's kind of interesting. Um, you should basically stick with the default Tor options on your proxy, because if you change it to something different than what other people are using, like the number of circuits or the amount of time it takes before you roll over to a new circuit, you're basically, um, you're, you're kind of flagging yourself. So you want to look like everybody else in the Tor network. So using the default options is, is a plus. Um, Active attacks involve basically compromising the Tor software, uh, or you know, getting a hold of private keys, or um, you know, running hostile um, components in the network. Um, this one's kind of interesting. If you can see, say, 10% of the Tor network, you, you can observe the traffic over it. You can try to DOS the other 90% to make your 10% more valuable and force traffic through your 10%. Um, and then smear attacks are basically just meaning uh, people, you know, giving Tor a bad image so that you know universities and people that run onion routers are forced to take them down. Um, and then you know distributing um, compromised versions of Tor. So you know if you go to the Tor website, they sign the releases and they you know you can see the source code and all that. Um, okay, I'll try to wrap up. Um, and then you can attack directories. Uh, this one's kind of important. If you compromise more than half the directories, which I feel like at this point is pretty much impossible, um, since the direct the view of the network is based on the majority, if you compromise more than half of the directories, you've compromised Tor as a whole. Um, so at this point, um, there's like there's thousands of onion routers out there. I'm not exactly sure how many directories there are, but I think in the hundreds. Um, and then the amount of users are like hundreds of thousands. You know, it's not really known how many because you're anonymous. Um, and when the paper was written, they had 
um, you know, like 30 something menu routers, and they guessed that there was about 100 to 200 users of the network. Um, Tor also has these things called rendezvous points. It's basically a way for you to have a server on the network. You know, everything we've talked about has basically been client driven traffic. You connect it to something outside of the network. Um, you can actually stand up a server in the network by designating a few different ID routers as um, what they call them? introduction points. And then a client, and then you have to advertise these introduction points somehow, which is not covered in the paper. Although, I think you mentioned. There's some way to do it. And they have like a DNS, their own internal DNS. Yeah, so you basically, if you want to rendezvous with a server in the network, you choose one of its advertised uh, rendezvous points. Um, and then the server will get a signal that someone's waiting for a connection at the rendezvous point, and then the server can choose whether or not to allow the connection. Uh, the reason they do that is because um, some onion routers might have different policies uh, on the router, so the server might have you know, co uh, content that's disagreeable to a particular router, so it won't allow certain types of connections from the router. Um, yeah, uh, questions? Okay. Question? Yeah. Uh, I think I saw like a thing downstairs that like Dirk did, uh, like tried to exploit this. You had like a malicious entrance node. Did you read that? On uh, the poster? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, so first of all, Dirk had. A, a, uh, I think he had to take it down because, you know, not everybody's aware of what it is and you, you get bad stuff coming out of the network. Um, so I think he, that poster down there is about an attack where you basically put up a hostile router and advertise way more bandwidth than you actually have to attract more users to your network and the more people you get coming through your particular router, the better chance you have of identifying sources to destinations. And then I think when you stop doing research, they may take it. Yeah, but it was just a it was just a router. It wasn't like an entrance or an exit. Well, any so, Tor router, save for the uh, exit policy, can be an exit. Oh, so okay. it's the, yeah. the your piece of software chooses what it's going to be an exit node. Some of them say no, I, I don't want to be an exit node. I'll just be a, you know an internal node. Mm -hmm. But um, there's no difference between there's no like technical difference between the two types. It's not like a different piece of software. They were running exit nodes for a little while, I and mean, they were running a set of nodes, but yeah, it was mouse right. The exploit was essentially to try to gain traffic through your nodes to increase your likelihood of being able to mount some of these other attacks. I mean, Tor has flaws, it's not perfect, but I mean, it's an attack like that also doesn't say it doesn't support it entirely, it just raises your odds and other ways to defend against it. It's not much worse. All right, I think I did it. You did well. Um, so, the aside to all of this is Tor is a volunteer network. So, I mean, you can all go use it for free. You know, there's a there's a, actually a special version of Firefox you can install that like has Tor baked into it. Um, or you can just you know install it. That's the easiest way. You just download Firefox with Tor baked in. You don't have to set anything up. Um, the alternative then is you can actually install the Tor software and run it and so on and so forth. When you're using the Tor network, you're just a load on the Tor network, right? And it's not like you're paying for that, but you're getting some benefit out of it, namely the ability to browse anonymously. Um, to pay for that, the ideal thing to do is if you're a heavy Tor user, you should also be hosting a Tor router somewhere because then you're actually giving back to the network. Uh, if you're a large corporation with a big data center or something, that's a really great thing to do. If you're thinking you're going to go home and fight the man by running an exit node in your house this evening, I would not recommend it because you will start getting a series of legal subpoenas and all other kinds of lawsuit threats. Tor stands on kind of interesting legal footing where it's not entirely decided, right? Are you responsible for the traffic that comes out of the network you pay for, even if it's not your traffic? Uh, so, you could run an intermediate node from your house where it's not an exit node, that's pretty safe. I mean, you're not really going to get, because you said in the middle of the network, no one's ever going to really see you. But running an exit node, you want to have lawyers on staff ISP before you. Shut you down. Yeah, well, your ISP might shut you down, right? But right. Wait, the lawyers so won't. One thing I forgot if you want to use Tor realistically, um, you got to be careful because um, if you set up Firefox, for example, to use the SOX proxy that is the Tor proxy on your computer. You need to make sure your DNS lookups are also going through the network. By default, Firefox will do the DNS lookups locally, and then pa 
broadcast IP addresses through the network. Um, there's a Firefox setting to make sure to force uh, pass uh, host names through the network so they get resolved on the other end. Um, so there's like little gotchas with Tor. Um, and with BitTorrent, it'll work over Tor either because of the way traffic, uh, the trackers work. So. If you go to the Tor website, they have a good FAQ where you can read all about this. Tor is a real thing, lots of people use it, uh, and there are a lot of legitimate uses, right? I mean, you don't be doing things you shouldn't be doing, but there are legitimate uses for it as well. Um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, you guys should all also be aware of, it is a volunteer, basically legal organization that specializes in digital rights. Um, they have a big brief on using Tor, and I mean, if you get to the point where you're using an exit note, that's something you want to read, because it becomes more legal issues than technical issues at that point. But the EFF might be willing to provide a lawyer to defend you in certain instances if you want to operate a Tor exit note, but don't do it at your house, it's not worth the trouble. If at some point you're running someone's data center and you can convince them that it's worth some of your time and donated bandwidth to host a Tor exit note, then you'll be doing a good cause for subverting oppressive regimes around the world, so on and so forth. All right.